a very happy moment when the Ojai Festival begins. So the ship she is launched. I'm Ara Guzlinian, and it's a great privilege to be with my friend and local hero, Tom Morris, the artistic director of the Ojai Festival. Tonight we celebrate one of the greatest friends of the Ojai Festival, Pierre Boulez, on the occasion of his 90th birthday year. Um, there are um, just a little bit of housekeeping. There are some changes in tonight's sequence of events. Um, the saddest of which is that Frank Gehry is unable to be with us. Um, yes, that deserves a big awe. Um, Frank has been suffering from an excruciatingly bad back, um, and I saw him in Los Angeles on um, Sunday morning, and things have gone from um, bad to worse. Uh, he went to the performance of Available Light in Los Angeles on Friday night and could not go on Saturday night because uh, the pain was uh, made moving about too difficult. And uh, he is extremely melancholy about not being here tonight. He has sent both Tom and me very forlorn uh, emails throughout the day multiple times, uh, just wanting to be with us in spirit. And in place of Frank, we will have a chance to talk to um, one of the real guiding, creating spirits behind the uh, beyond the score program, the Pierre Dream, that we'll be seeing tonight, Jared McBurney, who is um, one of the great artistic, musical, creative spirits in our field. And that will take the place of the 10.30 post-performance talk. So you're allowed an early evening tonight. Uh, only tonight. Uh, and. Um, it, it turned out that the match of blessed and most welcome rain and technology uh, wreaked havoc with some of yesterday's rehearsals. So at 10.30, there will be a rehearsal for something to come later uh, in, in the festival. Um, Pierre holds the Ojai record of sorts. He has been the most frequent music director in the history of the festival. His first time here was in 1967, and his most recent time was 2003. 2003. And uh, both Tom and I have been um, very privileged to uh, work closely with him over our own professional lives, and I think cherish the friendship as, as a real bond, not only uh, in our own friendship, but part of our devotion to uh, th the magic that's inherent in this very special place and this very special festival. And I would be remiss in not mentioning the, the great original spirit who brought um, Pierre Boulez to Ojai for the for first time, Lawrence Morton, who was really the defining <laughs> artistic director. Um, and uh, we have both seen Pierre uh, several times in the last year and a half or so, and talking about Ojai and talking about his friendship with Lawrence uh, remains very important and very close to the heart for, for Pierre Boulez. So, um, Tom, let's begin with a little bit of the overview of your work with music director Stephen Schick in how you came with the overall, came up with the overall shape of the festival and the centrality of celebrating Pierre Boulez within it. Well, as you will hear over the weekend, and as you know, uh, Steve Schick is uh, one of the most incredible percussion players and a complete enthusiast for uh, contemporary music, probably knows more contemporary music than almost anyone I've ever met. And when we started to talk about this festival, it was clear that there would be a very deep uh, presentation of composers, uh, composers of our time. Um, but of course, when you build programs or you build a festival, so much of it is about how you structure co context and set up differences so you hear 
pieces in relation to other pieces. And very early on, as we talked about the need to really concentrate on music of our time, uh, the thought was, you know, this is a, an incredible moment uh, to celebrate Pierre Boulez, uh, given what he has meant to this place and what Ojai means to him. Uh, I mean, I, I think uh, it's important to state that, that uh, this is one of Pierre Boulez's musical homes. Um, and when you talk with him about Ojai, uh, he would immediately talk about his first trip here in Lawrence Morton's uh, convertible coming through the upper Ojai Valley and all of a sudden looking uh, down into the valley, and they stopped. And uh, Pierre said, and all I could smell were orange blossoms. Uh, and he would get, he would get misty-eyed about this memory, and it's a memory that's so vivid, um, and he's so proud of the things that could be done here and the fearlessness right. of Ojai, which of course is Pierre. So the idea was let's, let's sort of structure the festival uh, in many ways with Boulez as the grand master, uh, as a thread, and let's also set up Boulez's music um, in context of composers that mean a lot to him, Bartok, Messian, and Ravel, uh, and also use that frame uh, on which to sort of present, I think there are 48 composers in this festival. Um, and that's how it, it came about. One of the touching things is that the resident ensemble, one of the resident ensembles this year is ICE, the International Contemporary Ensemble, who's very much a next generation ensemble, a young, um, emerging, formidable ensemble, along with some of the other groups, Renga and Redfish, Bluefish, and the others who are playing here. And you can see now the passage of this music to a generation that has not worked directly with Pierre. And, and it now belongs to a wild, wider world. And for a new generation of musicians, this becomes repertoire. I imagine that play was somewhere subtly in your and Steve's thinking. A absolutely. And um, uh, in many ways, I mean, I remember when uh, years ago when we were, would program music of Boulez, uh, it was actually hard to find performers who would really uh, were, were comfortable. I mean, it was hard to find performers who were comfortable with the Rite of Spring for a long time. Um, and listening to this incredible group, Ice, uh, perform all this music, and there's a lot of Boulez's music on the festival, um, uh, the facility and sort of sheer musicianship with, that they bring to it is quite overwhelming. And um, you'll get a very good taste of Boulez's music and Boulez the man uh, tonight, which will set the stage for uh, the complete performances of works that you'll hear uh, throughout the festival. Um, and I think uh, w one of the things that a number of people have commented on throughout this week is somehow the impression that has been generated that Boulez's music is thorny and difficult um, is surprisingly not the case. I mean, it's actually very much in the Debussy Ravel tradition. Yeah, he is um, inevitably and after all a French composer. And uh, in a conversation I did in a public conversation with him in recent years, he very directly acknowledged that surface beauty matters to him. Uh, of course, it's enormously complex music, but he also wants the listener drawn in. And in Pierre's case, I think there's this crystalline sonority of, of lots of bell-like sounds uh, that, that becomes a sort of immediate entry point. When did you first meet him? I, I'm, I, I, even though we've known each other for years, I don't know exactly your history. I, I really first met him um, uh, sort of uh, officially in about 1980. My first job was, was uh, on the staff of the Boston Symphony in 1969. And my first summer at Tanglewood, uh, P 
Pierre was doing his second uh, of only three performances ever with the Boston Symphony. The only one at Tanglewood. And I remember that first summer they were performing La Mer. And, um, and I remember going to a rehearsal and Boulez spent about a half an hour tuning one chord uh, uh, with the Boston Symphony. Uh, I was very struck by, by that, as, as were the members of the Boston Symphony. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, he was famously known as the man with x-ray ears yeah, among orchestra right. musicians. <laughs> but I, I really got to know him in uh, around 1980 when uh, he had just written this massive uh, piece at IRCOM, Repon, mm -hmm. and they, uh, the IRCOM people wanted to bring Repon to the States uh, and they came to Boston and w wanted to know if we would present it. And uh, I was intrigued. Uh, this is a piece, for, just massive technology. And uh, especially in those days. In those days, you, know, you couldn't travel with this in a suitcase. And, uh, you know, about 30 musicians and musicians all over, you, you basically needed a square room to do it. it and. Uh, I had this idea of doing it in Symphony Hall in Boston, where you can take the seats out for the Boston Pops, and we, we, we did do it, did two performances of it in about 1984, um, and somehow to do that music in that hall, and that seemed to cement our relationship. Pierre, um, you know, like lots of artists who blaze new paths, um, is extremely grateful to those who gave recognition and support early on. And I think um, it made for very strong friendships and, and it completely explains. Lawrence Morton was Stravinsky's great champion in Southern California. Um, Stravinsky was, you know, a little in lost in the desert uh, in his years in Los Angeles and Lawrence uh, and Monday evening concerts in the Ojai Festival really championed Stravinsky's music. And it was via Stravinsky, I asked Pierre this question just 10 days ago. Um, Pierre met Lawrence Morton via Stravinsky um, because uh, Stravinsky was so grateful to Lawrence for b being a, a sophisticated champion of his music, and he told Boulez that he should meet Lawrence Morton. And my first meeting with Pierre was in 1984, when he returned to Los Angeles after about a 14-year absence, for the first for the reopening of uh, Royce Hall at UCLA, and then he came here um, to to the Ojai Festival, and it was a charmed beginning because Lawrence was a hero mentor um, uh, to me. And under Lawrence's wing, um, I got to spend a good deal of time with. Pierre, I have one specific memory that, that um, I want to tell about that uh, time. Uh, Pierre conducted with the Los Angeles Philharmonic um, Elliot Carter's Symphony of Three Orchestras, which is one of the most extraordinarily dense and complex, um, challenging pieces. And it was a dazzling performance, so vivid and virtuosic that even if you didn't understand the note of it, somehow the power of the conviction and the vividness of the performance just was this huge force in the hall. And after the performance, Elliot Carter, who was a great friend of Boulez's, uh, was in, in attendance and Elliot was brought to the stage. He was you know, a mere lad of 76 at the time. Um, <laughs> Elliot, happily for all of us, lived to 103, still working in his last year. Um, Elliot was brought to the stage, and the crowd cheered as if you know the greatest rock star had come on. And I was sitting with Lawrence at the concert, and Lawrence was grinning like a Cheshire cat. And, and, and I looked at Lawrence, and I said, you look happy. And Lawrence, with his Cheshire cat grin, said, and in his true Minnesotan way, said, I like to see modern music get a good hand. <laughs> and for Lawrence, I think that was an emblematic motto, and that was at the heart of um, their bond. Um, a handful of Pierre memories for both of us, uh, I think, here. 
Um, I was artistic director in 96, um, and for those of you whose memories go to that festival, it was about 110 degrees. Like it was, uh, in, it, like it was a couple days ago. Right. Yeah, it was, it was very much like it was on Monday here. Um, and for the last concert, which was a Sunday afternoon concert with Mitsuko Ochida as the soloist, um, you know, here's Pierre, the formidable modernist, and in some quarters of the world, a rather feared figure here, a, you know, local hero. Um, and the Los Angeles Philharmonic was told, understandably, that they could wear anything they wanted <laughs> on stage. <laughs> So um, you had the most, to just to be comfortable enough to play. Um, you know, the air conditioning isn't great here uh, <laughs> when it's 100 degrees out. And Pierre walked out and um, took one look at this unbelievably motley crew with flip-flops and <laughs> shorts and T-shirts and sun hats and what, you know, whatever else, each person wearing whatever made them comfortable. He sort of took one look at the orchestra, looked at the audience, and took his jacket off and tossed it, and <laughs> took his tie off and tossed it. And if you look in your program books, there's a bow picture um, uh, in the page that recounts Boulez's history here. And you will notice that uncharacteristically in his bow with Mitsuko Ochida, Pierre Boulez is in shirt sleeves on stage at Ojai. I was, that was my first visit to Ojai, I remember that. And I remember very vividly listening with you, um, them rehearsing um, either La Valse or Valse Noble Sentimental, um, in, in, in which Pierre was conducting with such swing um, and, and such relish of, 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 of this music that Tom said to me, you know, he really should conduct Offenbach. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember his last performance as music director in 2003 when he conducted Mahler 9 with the LA Philharmonic. And it was a beautiful, beautiful Sunday afternoon. Uh, and in the incredible last movement, as can only happen in, in uh, Ojai, uh, with the old bowl, with the, with the trees in the audience, you know, with the canopy, uh, there were two squirrels that uh, became wildly attracted to each other. <laughs> and here's Pierre Boulez conducting Mahler 9, and these squirrels are chirping and running after each other on the branches. He actually, he, he and Hans both mentioned that That's specifically. Right. Oh, yeah. And there were several performances but that's, with but it's important. crows. <laughs> but, but that's Boulez. I mean, the, somehow the image is of this ferociously serious mind, uh, but he... He, he was a great friend, and he had a great sense of has a great sense of humor, and loves the sort of ridiculous side of life. When I saw him most recently, and you know, somebody here with a longer memory than mine will have to confirm this. He remembers in '67 that the Orange Train still ran, um, which I believe um, was on what's this trailway behind the stage? I think that's before. Uh, my time here, and and that performances and rehearsals would have to stop for the orange train uh, to to run past. He mentioned this to me about ten days ago, uh, as as one of his first uh, Ojai memories. Um, Tom, if you could, uh, this puts you in an impossible summarizing position, but. You know, now that um, his active career is uh, really behind him, if you could take a moment to summarize from your perspective his place in the scheme of musical life really over the last 60 years. Uh, well, uh, there's no question in, uh, in my mind that he has fundamentally changed the concept of programming of concerts uh, in everything he's done his entire life. Uh, the notion of programs that have a non-standard structure uh, that have uh, filled with even with little pieces that make big differences. Uh, and of course, his absolute uh, advocacy of uh, sections of the repertoire, the second Viennese school, Stravinsky, Bartok, um, uh, repertoire which is, um, which is really moved into uh, the center. 
Uh, I think it has, it has had a real lasting uh, effect uh, and the advocacy, his strong advocacy of that repertoire and his strong advocacy of fearlessness. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think that's a word that pops into my mind uh, more often than not. Um, in fearlessness with gusto. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, I credit him with uh, having a huge effect on me in terms of how I learned something about programming, and I, I think that's something we for, both for many share. Things, yeah. um, and, uh, and I think what's going to happen now, actually, is his music is going to emerge in much more central uh, than it has been. Um, again, as I said, there's a misconception about the music. And I hope that what we do this weekend will give you all a sense uh, in a very broad, uh, in a broad way, by not just listening to one piece, but listening to a lot of his music, and music that was composed over a very long period of time. Um, I mentioned that Frank has been sending us forlorn uh, emails about not being uh, able to travel to Ojai. Um, Frank sees Pierre as a complete kindred spirit, and we'll talk about how this originated, this kind of ritualized staging of Pierre's music that we'll see tonight with Jared McBurney. But Frank saw Pierre for the first time conduct the rug concerts um, at the New York Philharmonic. Boulez also played with concert format and did in the 70s what was unthinkable and what every orchestra is falling over themselves to do now, which is to attract young people by uh, creating very flexible and informal program concepts. And Frank was in the audience for um, some of those um, uh, concerts. And he really attri you know, attributes great importance to that fearlessness as an inspiration um, to him. And there's a very touching friendship between the two of them. In February of last year, um, Daniel Barenboim, who's extremely devoted to Boulez, is creating a new um, orchestral and rehearsal hall for the West Eastern Divan, the Palestinian-Israeli orchestra that Daniel Barenboim has created. And this hall will be in Berlin, near the State Opera in Berlin. And Daniel asked Pierre's permission if the hall could be called Pierre Boulez Hall, and which Pierre uh, gave. And Daniel asked Frank as a favor if Frank would design it. And Frank has lavished more love and attention on this little redo of a hall within an existing building um, than I'd say even some of his uh, much more large-scale projects because it's a complete labor of love. And in February of last year, Frank and I were both in Europe and we arranged to go to Baden-Baden and Frank parted with his cherished model of Boulez Hall. And, and it was like, a kid parting with his favorite toy. You could see Frank <laughs> very reluctantly turning it over because he loved this model so much. And, and Pierre was like a kid receiving it with such glee at the, the generosity of his gift. And it, it, it occupies this kind of um, beautiful central space in Pierre's living room now. So um, that's uh, Frank's homage uh, to, to his great friend Pierre. And, and in an email Frank wrote to uh, Tom earlier today, um, there's a very strong sentiment. He closes the, uh, the email, which is uh, very sad that he's not here. He said, I did the design, which is what you're going to see tonight. I did the design for Pierre. He is our inspiration. So um, Tom, thank you. And uh, we'll have ample time to spend with each other during the course of the Absolutely. festival. Thank you, Ara. And uh, we will now um, bring on two um, musicians who have 
decades, in some cases close to 60 years of history playing with Pierre Boulez in Southern California at Monday evening concerts and here at the Ojai Festival. Um, and, and Tom will bring out um, Ralph Grierson, very great pianist, composer, um, and William Kraft, percussionist and composer. And here they are. For you. You know, I mentioned Lawrence Morton as uh, one of the heroes of adventurous music life in um, uh, Southern California for the last 60 or so years, um, that hero had great, great accomplices. And here are two of the most formidable accomplices um, in, in those glory early years of both Ojai and the Monday evening concerts, both with the music of Stravinsky and Boulez and many, many others. Um, Ralph as a brilliant, brilliant pianist. And he was playing to our enchantment backstage before we came out, so it keeps going. And, and Bill, not only as a distinguished composer in his own right, but as a great percussionist, and for many years the, the principal uh, timpani of the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Um, Bill, you get pride of place. I, Bill goes back, Pierre, uh, Pierre Boulez made his American debut, uh, his first appearance as a conductor in um, the United States in 1957 with the American premiere of his hallmark piece, Le Marteau Sans Maitre, which was receiving its first US performance. And this was a piece that had premiered and taken Europe by storm in 1956. And Bill was a percussionist in that performance in 1957. So um, tell us. Bill, um, you've regaled me with stories, and now it's their turn to hear about the circumstances. Um, this was very difficult music in 1957. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, it was. Uh, we started rehearsals with Robert Kraft. Um, we had 60 rehearsals with him, S 60 hours. 60 hours, six, six zero. Six zero, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and on Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock at Dorothy Remsen's house. Uh, Who was a harpist in the ensemble. Uh, Dorothy was uh, uh, the studio's number one call harpist, fantastic musician. Uh, and I had heard that she had played marimba uh, in her earlier years, and uh, she had studied with uh, George Hamilton Green, who is a, a xylophonist. If you can imagine a, a person making a profession of playing the xylophone, uh, well. <laughs> and that's a percussionist talking. <laughs> <laughs> my best nightmare, or my worst nightmare is standing in the middle of a Manhattan busy intersection, naked, playing the xylophone. <laughs> and the hard part is the xylophone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Robert Kraft, as I said, was rehearsing. And uh, the, as I told Ara earlier, um, the Lamarto Thaumetra was to the second half of the 20th century, what the, what the Rite of Spring was to the first half. Uh, it did pick up uh, uh, like, like the Rite of Spring, but for the professionals, it was of that level. Uh, and on Friday, as I was saying, uh, Bob Kraft said, uh, I can't do it. And he went to the phone, and by chance, Pierre was in San Francisco visiting a friend, 
uh, Bob called him and asked if he could come down and conduct the piece. Uh, so Pierre came down Saturday morning uh, before the Monday evening concert and started the rehearsal. The piece began with a uh, 3-8 measure, and the tempo marking in the original version was 208 to the quarter. Very fast. Yeah, that's almost a continuous sound. <laughs> uh, and Pierre started the rehearsal, uh, the 3-8, and he counted off under 12, and nobody played. <laughs> So I said, is, is that a perfume? <laughs> <laughs> and his English was not great, and his, he was very reserved with his humor. Uh, it was hard to make him laugh. Uh, he did not laugh. <laughs> um, he said, un, deux, trois. Oh, that's one, two, three, we figured out. <laughs> so he started again, but much slower. Uh, during the rehearsals, all the composers of note in the Los Angeles area would come to the rehearsals. Uh, and we were amused watching them turning pages back and forth, back and forth, <laughs> trying to find their, their place. And who was the only one turning pages at the right time? Stravinsky. <laughs> uh, we were nasty, I mean, smirking. But, uh, <laughs> we, you know, Pierre pulled it off. Uh, when the Monday concert came, uh, uh, the Marteau, the, the piece I'm talking about, takes a viola, uh, three percussionists. Flute, viola, harp, and three percussionists. Right. What was the other besides the viola? Flute. Oh, yeah, alto flute. Alto flute. Yeah. And at the concert, none of us were able to play straight through the piece. We took a little time off uh, here and there to find out wh where we're supposed to be. <laughs> the only person who made sound all the time <laughs> was uh, Arthur Claghorn, the flutist, who was an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank God for him. You know. <laughs> so we got through somehow. I saw Pierre a year later, and I, I said, uh, that was really a disaster, wasn't it? He says, palm all. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> Just for comparison, um, when I worked for the Los Angeles Philharmonic in the 80s, Pierre came, and there was a program put together by the Arnold Schoenberg Institute and the wonderful Leonard Stein um, in honor of um, the, an anniversary year of, I think, both pieces. So it was Piero Lunaire and Marto Sommetra was the program. And I think the members of the Los Angeles Philharmonic in whatever year that was in the 80s put together Marto Sommetra with Pierre in six or seven rehearsals, which just tells you, again, this thing that Tom and I were talking about earlier, that it's somehow this music then begins to enter the DNA of a subsequent generation. And one of the most astonishing things, it's, it's still an extraordinarily complex piece, but I remember Pierre trained in the good French solfege tradition, you know, Dore, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, uh, Si, Do, or Ti, Do, would, when he corrected a phrase, he would say, no, 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 it's, you know, he sounded like he was scat singing, and he was singing, singing absolutely the right pitches at these impossible tempi. And so this is a composer for whom what was on the page was not remotely an abstract thing, but very much a matter of sound. And over the process of the rehearsals with the subsequent generation of players, you actually heard the elements lock together 
and, and sonorities and pitches begin to, to connect. And, um, you know, it's a very different experience than what happened the very first time around. And, and um, that's the beauty of musical evolution, in a sense. Uh, Ralph, when did you first come into contact? And what are some of your high points over the years, including perhaps right here? Uh, this is working great. My first Ojai Festival was 1967 with Boulez. And I have an interesting story just to kind of set it up uh, in that uh, I was in my first year of my master's program at USC uh, in piano. I'd gotten a bachelor's, studied with John Crown, and you know, it was a golden age uh, at USC in those days with Ingolf Dahl and uh, Yudhish Shapiro and Al Sailors, all these great teachers. But uh, as a requirement for a graduate student, one had to take a course called Introduction to Graduate Studies, where you were taught how to use the, the files and, and the card indexes and all the research capabilities. And of course, I was taking this class. I got a call. Uh, I think it was from Lawrence Morton, who said, how would you like to play Les Nos uh, and some Verez at the Ojai Festival with Boulez? And I'm, I'm higher than a kite, you know, I'm so excited. The only problem was that this conflicted with my final for my Introduction to Graduate Studies <laughs> course. I went to the teacher, who I must say was not typical of, of uh, all my teachers at USC, who were just amazing supporters and everything else. But this man, you know, was definitely a, a musicologist uh, in another world from mine. Because I, I excitedly went to him and said, you know, I've, I've got a chance to work with Pierre Boulez at the OI Festival. Can I get an incomplete or something in my... And he looked me straight in the eye and he said, well, young man, he said, you're going to have to uh, make a decision as to whether you want to get a degree from this university or do that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was dumbfounded. I was speechless I, 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 because I thought that's what I was at USC for, was to do that sort of thing. So, so Boulez, for me, is that sort of thing. And, and Ojai, uh, because that began a, a, a run. I mean, I, I've played some 15 years, almost, in sequence. And then there was a long gap. And then I played in 1994 again when Michael was here. But I got to play Les Nos with, with Pierre. And I got to play the Verez with Pierre. And, and the inspiration that came from that rehearsing uh, and as you say, there were people for whom, I heard someone say earlier, Stravinsky was, was a challenge. Um, and now this is another level with, with Boulez and his, and his ability to, to hear and, and his insistence on a, a level of perfection that most people were not aspiring to, you know, at their best. Um, there was a case in rehearsals for Lenos where there was a percussionist who was of that older school, not quite making it. And Pierre, I mean, you talk about you know, people, him being formidable or whatever. He was the most gracious man, but s insistent that he wanted perfection. And this man was unable to deliver. And, and on top of that, didn't have a very good attitude about it. Um, and Pierre replaced him the next day. And Larry Bunker, who was a colleague in the studio, stepped in and just nailed it. It was great. This musician, who's fortunately my, whose name I've forgotten, um, I think later tried to file charges with the union with Pierre. And of course, that would be laughable, because everyone knew how patient he was. But it was just amazing. And, the, and then my second performance with him was playing Contrapunkta of Stockhausen, uh, one of the three most difficult pieces thing I think I've ever played in my life, a claw multiple being the other one, and the Tarangalila Symphony being the other. Uh, rehearsing contrapunta, first of all, Lawrence, in his wonderful psychological uh, mode, came to me and said, you know, Pierre has not been happy with any keyboard player who has played this piece. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, which had, had its desired effect because I was <laughs> determined that you know I was not going to be another one of those. So I worked my tail off uh, and and did a good job. But there was a, a place during one of the rehearsals where Pierre stopped and he said, uh, "No," he said in the piano, uh, uh, called out and said, "It's B." And I said, "Well, no, that's what I have." It turned out that in a sequence of seven notes, my part was missing an octava sign, and I was playing a B an octave lower than it was supposed to be. And out of that cluster of seven notes, he heard that. Uh, and you know, you just say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my observation uh, from years, uh, p particularly at the Los Angeles Philharmonic, of seeing Pierre work is exactly as Ralph and Bill described. He is so supremely confident in his knowledge of that music that he, and, and he comes to a rehearsal, and I've seen him conduct student orchestras, and, and it's the same, same thing. He comes to it with the quiet expectation that you respond with the same level. And it's just a matter of sort of setting the bar at that very high level and waiting patiently while everybody rises to it. Would you, I see you nodding. <laughs> Do you? It's so true. It's so, so true. And in, in doing that, he's, as Tom said, he's established this immense repertoire, um, really from Stravinsky and Schoenberg forward to Stockhausen and, and Messian and Zanakis and Ligeti of being performed so well that the content of the piece now becomes receivable. Uh, and and I, I think in his career as a, a conductor, that's really uh, the most extraordinary uh, achievement. Uh, this is the one other hallmark event, not so much in Ojai, but in both Ralph's and Bill's experience and in Pierre's history. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware this is the 50th anniversary of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. One of the things Lawrence Morton did for the establishment of the LA County Museum of Art was to commission from Pierre Boulez a brand new piece, which was a piece called Eclat, so which had its world premiere in Los Angeles in 1965, exactly 50 years ago this year. And Pierre is a very restless process composer, um, and so he has constantly rethought and expanded and elaborated on very charged, contained ideas in his pieces, and Eclat grew to become Eclat Multiple. And Ralph, maybe you could uh, recount a little bit of your history. Ralph didn't play the very first performance. It has a incredibly difficult solo piano part, but a friend of his who, who will be known to you and Ojai did, and then Ralph eventually took over. Uh, well, I actually went to the rehearsal, rehearsal of Eclat uh, during uh, that nine, six, 1965, and I was at a rehearsal when, uh, well, we're traveling sensitive ground here, but we'll just not mention names. Uh, <laughs> A pianist was, was scheduled to, to, again, play that piece who was very busy and sent a sub to the rehearsal, which I cannot imagine sending a sub to a, a, a Boulez uh, <laughs> rehearsal. Um, uh, make a, a long story short, uh, within a couple of days, Michael Tilson Thomas was now the pianist for Eclat, and he did a brilliant job. And, uh, and that piece, again, it was just another level of difficulty and whatever. And then uh, I got the chance to play Eclat Multiple with Michael conducting here, which, again, was a much extended uh, version of the piece. But we're, uh, I, I'm, later on, uh, Gloria Chang uh, got to play Eclat Multiple here with Boulez. And uh, in the beginning, I, I I said to her, I said, you know, we're part of a very small group of people <laughs> who know what it's like to play the piano part in a clown multiple. And it's true, there's probably not too many people in the world who have done it and who know that. I, it just reminded me of a very, uh, another sweet memory. I, um, Gloria played um, 
in one of the Ojai festivals, I think, in the 90s, uh, Pierre's Notation, which is his first published piece from 1945, 12 brief, murderously difficult pieces for uh, solo piano. And Pierre had originally written it for himself. And I was sitting at a performance with Pierre watching a very fine pianist in New York play it. Um, and there is a famously impossible with the crossing hands in, in notation. And, and after the performance, I, I looked at Pierre and said, you must have been a very good pianist if you wrote that for yourself. And he said, that is when I stopped playing. <laughs> 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 we will, in a moment, um, turn over the stage to Jared McBurney, who's uh, the, the creative guiding spirit behind this portrait of Pierre, a Pierre dream that we'll be um, uh, seeing tonight. But I wanted to join you in um, thanking our Ojai and Los Angeles and uh, Boulez heroes, Ralph Grierson and Bill Kraft. It's now my great pleasure to welcome Jared McBurney to Ojai. Jared, uh, along with our great friend and colleague, Martha Gilmer, who's now the chief executive of the San Diego Symphony. Martha, are you here? There she is. There she um, is. She, Martha and Jared should get a huge uh, bow for not only this performance, but uh, creating this whole concept of beyond the score. And Jared began to tell me that Pierre somehow even had a hand in the origin of beyond the score. I think that he had more than a hand in it because the origins of beyond the score, which was a program that arose in the mind of Martha Gilmer in before I ever went to the Chicago Symphony Orchestra in what we might call the late Barenboim years, which um, makes the history of any orchestra sound like the Byzantine Empire. Um, <laughs> one emperor gives way to another. And uh, she and Pierre, over many years, talked about how you can uh, change the format of concerts, expand. Of course, Boulez was famous for doing this, famous for doing it in the rug concerts in New York, in my hometown of London, the Roundhouse concerts, which I went to many times when I was a, a youngster. Uh, that was always a concern, and part of that was what we were called outreach, creating a kind of drama that, where people were drawn into music that they didn't know, and that could be almost any kind of music. It wasn't just new music. Um, and I, I certainly, growing up as a, in the UK, remember Boulez's astonishing things which went out live on Radio 3. So I remember as a schoolboy listening to those performances and hearing Pierre talk and saying some rather startling things about Messiaen, who was sitting in the front row of the audience. And I couldn't understand the embarrassed laughter of the audience. But um, in Martha Gilmer's uh, uh, and Pierre's hands, there arose a discussion I was not present or even thought of, or even a twinkle in their eye, uh, as to how one might change uh, and ex find new ways to draw people into the orchestral repertoire. And then there's a, uh, Frank Geary and uh, uh, LA, California link here because um, Martha Gilmer and Matthias Tarnopolsky, who is now, um, of course, at Cal Performances, they decided to come and see a show uh, that my brother Simon McBurney and I created for the LA Philharmonic for the opening season of the Disney Hall uh, when we got to work with Frank, which was very exciting, and of course with S. Pekka Salonen. And it was in the wake of that that Martha Gilmer invited me to uh, visit Chicago and talk about the possibility of creating something. But I didn't know at that point that uh, she had already talked a good deal with 
uh, Pierre Boulez, and immediately he offered to conduct one of the first shows that we did, which was about the miraculous Mandarin of Bartok. And he asked to see all the images. He asked to see my script. He made major corrections in my script. He said there should be much more about Freud in the script. And my knowledge of Freud was, how should we say, patchy. Um, <laughs> And I telephoned a friend of mine in uh, London in the middle of the night who had a rather substantial knowledge of Freud. And I said, I have Pierre Boulez at my back saying, I have to have more Freud in this text. Where do I look? <laughs> and he was very clever. He got me off the hook there. But the, from, from that point on, one of the things that happened is a very, very simple thing and I think very characteristic of, of Pierre. Martha said to me, we must find out if Pierre wants to take part in the show, apart from conducting it. And he said, I asked, so I asked him, and he said, no, I will say something before the beginning of the show. And that was the end of that conversation. Well, when we did the, the show, Pierre came out and turned to face the audience with a little card in his hand. I don't know where that card has now gone, but it's a historical document. And it is a declaration of, I guess, what I would call openness. It's a declaration of the principle that music is not an exclusive club. It's not something close to people, but that we all have a responsibility to open the doors and windows of any work of music, from ancient Greek music to, to now, uh, to so that everybody feels able to walk in just as they can walk in here across the park and into this magnificent um, space. And we filmed him, we recorded him, because the whole occasion was recorded. And from then on, at least until very recently, um, his slightly edited version of what he said w was put at the top of all the filmed, streamed versions online. So whatever beyond the score it was, you could hear Pierre talking about uh, why work like this was important. And whenever he visited Chicago, he would ask me when I saw him how it was going. He would ask to see the latest scripts. And then we did another one. Um, we did one about Pierre Luna, which is one of the ones I'm most proud of which, uh, again, I, sh I spent many hours talking with him and showed him what I was doing. And he was deeply involved, even though in the end his eyesight was too poor to conduct it. So it was sort of logical um, as we came up to 10 years of this project, so nearly the 30th show, that Martha turned to me and said, we should do, we've never done one on a living composer and the obvious thing to do is one about Pierre. And so she asked him, and he graciously agreed. And what you will see tonight uh, includes an, the footage from an extraordinary three days that we spent with him, I guess, 18 months ago, 19 months ago. It was in the fall of that year, where we went to Baden-Baden. We spent three days involving some very expensive and delicious meals, I remember. <laughs> And um, we filmed on and on. And s there were three of us talking with him. Barry Gavin, the filmmaker, who's an old friend of a number of people here and who was here in Ohio quite a number of times, who made some of the earliest films about Boulez. And you will see footage in this show from some of Barry's very early films about Boulez. And myself and Martha. And I would just like to say, since Martha is in the audience, that having done many interviews in my life, Martha Gilmer was able to draw all the best lines out from Pierre. He, she looked him in the eye and he talked in ways that I must say I'd never heard him talk before. Well, and I, I will say, um, I'm sure much to Martha's embarrassment that um, for many of us who, who are quite devoted to Pierre and enjoy lovely, rewarding friendships. There's um, something about Martha's devotion to uh, Pierre and his to her. Um, when I was there last, um, 
Actually, very recently, just coincidentally, um, Martha called while I was visiting with Pierre, and uh, he, you know, the, oh, hello, Martha. <laughs> you know, he just brightened noticeably at Martha's call. So um, this, this is also a, a testimonial to a particularly lovely and devoted friendship. Talk about <laughs> the wonderful, brief, and immensely productive encounter with Frank Gehry. Ah, this was a different kind of serialism. Um, I described to Martha the kind of projecting surfaces that I wanted to work with. And she said, you need somebody important to design them. So I, I said, did you by any chance have anybody in mind? Frank Geary, she said. So I slightly blenched, but said, OK, we'll go to um, LA. I went with my young colleague, and uh, we, through Esapeka Salonen, we got in touch with Frank, and he kindly agreed to meet with us. And we walked into that front office in that enormous <laughs> building of his, and I have to say the outlook did not look did not seem promising. He looked at us rather like we were something the cat had brought in, <laughs> and. I started to describe the project, and he listened very silently with his eyes half closed. And then eventually he summoned his wonderful colleague, um, Craig, and they listened some more. And then they decided to take us on a tour of the models. And we saw the, the one that you talked about, the model for the Boulez Hall in Berlin. And he, Pierre, Frank played with it for a bit. Um, he started talking about other things, and I was convinced he was going to say no. So then we went back into the office, and he seized a sheet of paper, which you actually have reproduced here in the program, borrowed a pen from Craig, and drew the drawing that you've got there. There was nothing written on it. And he said, do it like this. And I said, so, so you're... You're prepared to, I, I think I've written this in the note, you're, you're, you're happy to take part in this. And he said, are you kidding? This is for Pierre. And he then uh, signed it. Um, the original is now with Martha, I think. She has it. Um, we gave it to her for her leaving present from Chicago. And then he wrote the words, a Pierre dream at the bottom. That was completely spontaneous. And I, I was not very bright about this, because later on, the publicity department of the orchestra said, what are we calling this show? And I scrabbled around for titles. And then I looked and said, but Frank's already given it a title. That's what it is. Um, so we owe to Frank also the title of this show. One interesting tie that, that Frank has pointed out between him and Pierre, and it's somehow distantly ritualized in, in this in, in an unexpected way. Pierre um, traveled to Japan and was drawn in the 60s and at the time of a piece of his called Rituel in Memoriam Bruno Moderna and was very much drawn to the ceremonial music of um, Gagaku, I think. Yes, and Bunraku. And Bunraku. Mm -hmm. And unbeknownst to Pierre, a world away, um, actually before then, when Frank first, Frank Gehry first moved to Los Angeles, um, he, Frank has had a love-long affair with music, and he recently said if he does nothing but concert halls for the rest of his life, he'd, he'd be happy. I mean, he really lives for music. Um, and, and didn't have much of an active performance life as a child. Um, and he talked about him when he moved to Los Angeles, UCLA's Department of Ethnomusicology was in its first great blossoming under an, uh, a pioneering ethnomusicologist named Mantle Hood. And, and there was a gagaku ensemble at UCLA. And Frank played in the gagaku ensemble. And, and Frank finds this somehow an unexpected tie between him and Pierre. And maybe you could talk about how it's somehow ritualized in this. Well, um, I was rather slow on the uptake about this because it's true that Frank talked about his experience in California, and Pierre, in those interviews, talked about 
his discovery of um, what he calls Oriental music, which came about actually through Massian. Massian had become obsessed. And of course, there's a whole tradition of this with French composers. Um, Ari, you were saying earlier, and so was Tom, that, that, that Pierre belongs to the tradition of Debussy and Ravel. Well, they were both uh, swept away by the experience of Javanese music, Japanese music, which, and Chinese music, which they, and Indian music, of course, as well, which they, all of which they heard in the various world fairs. It's a fascinating part of the, the world's fairs, whole world's fairs story, going, in fact, right back to the Crystal Palace in, in 1851 or whenever it was, that um, it led to the spread of musical knowledge, which was simply unheard of. Before, before that, and by the late 19th century, including, I say proudly as an adopted Chicago in the Chicago World's Fair, there were ensembles from all over uh, other parts of the world. And so they, they talked about that. But it wasn't until last June, when we, Mike Tutai, who made the, fa the artist who made these fantastic projections that you'll see, he and I were allowed to do a workshop with dummy copies of these um, banners based on Frank's design. And we wanted to find out whether they were safe, what they would do in the theater. And we had a bunch of young actors, students, who gave up several days to work with us. And we just did a, what you do in a theater workshop, which is experiments. And as we played with the lights and played with throwing images up there and, and the, against the sound of music, we looked at them, and suddenly the whole idea of the old idea of the Oriental became completely clear to us. Yes, Orientalism is a Western construction. Many people here were friends with uh, the late Edward Said, who, of course, had many very harsh things to say about the way that Western culture has objectified the East. But I would just like to say that objectifying the East, while it may not be a very moral thing to do with Eastern culture, has led to a startling explosion of artistic ideas among many, many Western artists. I would name Picasso among those, Stravinsky also among those, and in our time, Boulez and Giri. You will um, shortly see the results of uh, this wonderful work that grows out of um, not only great creative inspiration on Jared and Mike and Martha's and many others' part, um, but I think uh, real devotion to uh, one of the great musical heroes of our time. Um, there, we will now take about a 20-minute intermission, and then a Pierre dream um, will begin. I would be remiss if I didn't mention what Tom asked me to mention, that at the end of the performance, there will be champagne and cupcakes in the park to celebrate Pierre Boulez's birthday. So um, welcome to Ojai, and thank you for being here.